Well, most importantly, I want to, I'm Gary Arlen, and I want to welcome you to this. Thanks, Tim, for inviting me to uh, moderate a session that's uh, dear to my heart for a long time. Before we get started, I want to just ask the audience, how many of you want to spend the next hour strictly discussing NBC Comcast? Only topic. Only topic. How many would like to have us address a little bit about advertising, DRM, spectrum management, and some other topics that are part of the, yeah, OK, well. Seems to be and how many of you just got off your feet then? I mean. <laughs> All right, so let's just plow right into this. We've got a lot to go through if indeed we want to cover this. And because after this last session on open internet, we want to have a very open session. So I've structured it with some topics we'd like to talk about. But if you have a burning issue, as you hear someone say something up here, just pop up to the mic or wave your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. We really want to um, engage this conversation, which is a very cru crucial issue on an awful lot of topics. So. I'll start by uh, introducing our first presenter, who actually is the only presentation of the day. Bill Lehrer from um, MIT actually is going to talk to us a little bit about some ideas and some issues of how video online and online video and hopefully wireless video on the internet, something addressed in the last session, uh, will operate. Bill is uh, with the Center for Technology Policy and Industrial Development at MIT. And uh, he's also a research associate in the computer science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT, and he's working on some communications future program issues, which we'll uh, hear about, and then hopefully in contact with your industry uh, academic alliance, multidisciplinary alliance work. So I'm going to turn it over to Bill Lair to give us a little primer in how online video works and some of the issues involved in it. Bill? Are you going to introduce the other folks now? Or? I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you stand alone first. Okay. So. So uh, they get The Economist up here to talk about the technology, which um, guarantees that'll be a fairly short discussion of that, although I'm from MIT, so at least I'm hanging around with the right folks to, to talk about this. Um, I, I looked at this panel and I said, okay, we're talking about you know, television, the disruption of the television industry, and video on the internet, and obviously the NBC uh, Comcast uh, thing is relevant, so is this whole sort of level three Comcast flap we've heard about and uh, a bunch of stuff that was alluded to in the earlier uh, panel. When one looks at you know, the, the uh, television entertainment uh, video industry, um, you know, you've got sort of the content creation, the program aggregation distribution piece, and the distribution piece. And I'll mostly be talking about the distribution piece. But um, obviously, the internet and the technology the internet brings has had really profound implications for all of that. So if you're talking about content creation, you know, think about going from It's a Wonderful Life to Toy Story to Avatar to uh, all the new media stuff, gaming, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the internet's obviously had a really huge role to play there, and perhaps most importantly, uh, in, in really opening up the potential for creation, new models for creation and sharing of content, especially the most salient and obvious thing there being all the uh, user-generated content that's coming out there. And when you think about sort of the next piece uh, in the traditional sort of television model, the uh, program aggregators and distributors, you know, historically the networks and the channels, because the distribution was scarce, you know, the airwaves, so they only had a few networks, they organized the programming in a very linear way, they packaged it, they put together sort of the financing model. Uh, to, to basically link together the ad dollars and um, uh, eventually the subscription uh, dollars uh, for, for sort of programming. But, you know, think about all the new things that the Internet's brought us in terms of really revolutionizing that. Things like Netflix, where, you know, the real innovation there was, you know, basically saying, I can give you much richer program selection and um, I can use a really broadband channel. I'll use the mail. Um, to send you disks around, um, or iTunes and what the iTunes model, application store, podcasting, and all of that has done. Uh, and then, of course, obviously, the proliferation of networks and channels as the distribution conduit has gotten much fatter with you know, HBO, Showtime, and you know, the whole proliferation of uh, networks that have uh, taken off uh, on uh, direct broadcast satellite and um, on cable. Um, and then, of course, if you think about uh, distribution, you, know, you start out with sort of over the air, uh, and then you sort of have cable and direct broadcast satellite saying, hey, we can really wind that conduit pipe, get all more content to you. It's still a pretty integrated thing. It's still a leaning back kind of experience. Um, but then you start getting, you know, as you begin to digitize that, you start getting the possibility of much richer sorts of content um, and uh, integration, real integration with the computer world. Uh, and sort of that's sort of where we're, you know, in, in the middle now, sort of putting that together with the internet. 
And so we've got a lot of things like you know, IPTV, where when I think about IPTV, I'm thinking about um, the carriers using not over the internet, not over the top necessarily, but using basically uh, ba uh, data transport, IP transport, to distribute the, tech to distribute the uh, video. And uh, that's, of course, happening. What we're mostly talking about today, though, is going to be the over the top, which is you know, this latest flavor of the disruption, which is um, putting uh, access to video content uh, on the internet and getting access to it over your broadband connection in your home or wherever else you're getting it. And of course, then the other really big technology piece, which uh, our opening keynote talk this morning spent a lot of time talking about, was what's happening with wireless uh, 4G and uh, making TV mobile and really enabling sort of uh, television everywhere. You know, the, the, these, these things are all, it's, it is a very fluid and active um, uh, innovation market, and the technologies are very unsettled. And I think, you know, sort of all the players are all over the place um, in, in, in all parts of this. So, you know, Comcast has its plays on the net, its web. It's competing with other people that are purely over-the-top providers. It's also got its... Um, services, you know, it's thinking about how to do the broadband, it's thinking about its uh, architecture of how it's eventually going to migrate towards uh, a pure IP platform, although right now that's not what it's doing. Um, that's not the way it's delivering technology today. You know, Verizon has a different strategy, et cetera. Um, in terms of the high-level issues, some of the high-level issues that I think we'll be talking about, one is this question about traffic. You know, who pays for all of the traffic if video is just as, just thinking about it, it's a lot of megabytes coming across the infrastructure. Um, recent report said something like 43% of uh, uh, broadband traffic today is real-time entertainment. Uh, that's up from 30% in 2009. And 20% um, of that traffic during the peak hours is coming from Netflix alone. And that's a really big shift. Of course, that's today's flavor. So what's going to be tomorrow's? But it is a lot of traffic. And so one of these issues is going to be, how do we deal with that? Another big issue is, as um, the internet becomes more important, in the uh, TV broadcast space, entertainment space, how do we deal with all the traditional uh, broadcast regulations, the must-carry retransmission issues, program access issues, porn, uh, media concentration, et cetera? And of course, also, how does this uh, uh, intersect with the copyright and rights management in these much richer spaces with the new media, where there are so many different ways to reposition the content, there are so many more channels. Uh, you know, it's interesting to think, for example, about VCRs. When VCRs came in, you know, a lot of people talk about, oh, this is an amazing thing because it's going to allow us to do time shifting. And of course, if people could time shift, then that maybe unbundle the programming channels. And really, what the big effect of the VCRs was, uh, was a whole new distribution channel for something that people didn't really think about, you know, cassette recorders through, you know, blockbuster video, et cetera. Um, the other really big issue, uh, another big issue, is going to be sort of uh, the uh, uh, intersection of broadband and the future of online mobile TV sort of everywhere, and the question of what really is going to be sort of uh, the, the future of using these. If, if the broadband future is really just about more TV everywhere, then I don't think it's all that interesting, and I don't think we'd be thinking about spending as much money as we're talking about spending on this and focusing as much of our hopes for economic growth, and et, et cetera, on this. So it's got to be about a lot of other stuff, and we really have to think about that, too. And then, of course, there's the, the other last issue, and it's going to be the issue that a lot of people is going to drive a lot of what people are thinking about here, is how are, how are the dollar flows going to be remapped between advertising, between subscription models, and between you know, pay-per-view unbundled sorts of models. From a purely technical point of view, if you think about a number of the technical issues that the internet has to confront to deal with this. You know, I already talked about the fact that we got lots of traffic. That means you have to sort of figure out how to uh, what's the right kind of investment, where do you put caching, this sort of stuff, and how you're going to manage that um, uh, resources more efficiently to share it so you're not like having a bunch of boxes that are sitting empty. So, you know, can you uh, operate them at higher utilization, which means network management. Um, you know, we're going to have to think about this question about is this going to be a broadcast type of delivery of content? Is that what we're going to be doing with a lot of this media? Or is it going to be unicast, individual streams? If it's unicast, we're going to be using a lot more bandwidth. Or is it going to be something like multicast? And how are we going to do multicast? You know, we've been trying to do this in the internet community for a long time. Uh, the movement to mobile and the integration of mobile, you know, uh, potentially increases our interest in thinking about this again. Um, and then there's the fact that with the internet, what we're really hoping to do, what we're seeing, is a much more integration of user control, the user being able to control what the devices are, many more ways that um, the traditional model, the entertainment experience, the management of the entertainment experience can leak out 
uh, into the user, you know, in their home, uh, onto other devices. There's all these boxes like Apple TV and things like that that are new, new, new pieces in this space. And then, of course, the interactivity, the making this more of a leaning forward as opposed to leaning back uh, sort of experience. And let me just stop there and uh, turn over to Pam. Thanks, Bill. Well, you set the stage for us very well as a uh, data wonk myself. I'll add a couple of data points to where you are. What you talked about, this uh, incredible growth of video on the net, Cisco recently uh, forecast that by 2014, just three years from now, 90% of the data traffic on the net will be video. Uh, we're seeing it in the examples you cited from uh, Netflix and certainly from YouTube. YouTube alone, pick a, a data point there that uh, in 2008, it offered 83 million videos. By 2009, it streamed 1.2 videos, 1.2 billion videos per day. And at the end of last year, YouTube, its playback count was 700, hit 700 billion. And uh, right now it's uploading 35 hours of video each minute. So there's not enough viewing time to watch all the video that's just available on YouTube. So we're looking at issues that uh, Bill also cited like advertisers who are increasingly using the web to uh, target audiences. And we're going to talk a little bit about that during the next hour. So with that in mind, let's uh, look at the policy challenges. And, I'll introduce the other panelists. You have a brief description of them, but let me start with Marvin Amori, who is uh, at the University of Nebraska Law School. His expertise is in internet and media law, and among his many other claims to fame, he was the lead lawyer before the FCC in the uh, Comcast BitTor BitTorrent case a couple of years ago, which has gone on to further fame. Sitting next to him is Richard Bennett, who is the senior research fellow uh, at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation here in Washington. He specializes in broadband networking and internet policy. And of course, uh, alphabetically, we'll go to the end of the table, Susan Crawford, who we know is the uh, professor of, uh, at the Cardoza Law School in New York and uh, visiting research collaborator at Princeton University's Center for Information Technology Policy. A lot of us know her from her days at the FCC and the White House. And, um, We'll hear a lot more from her. And of course, out of order, alphabetically, we've got Adam Tier right in the middle. He's now the Senior Research Fellow at uh, the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. His new uh, facial hair has given him the title of the evil Spock, and we'll have to talk about that a little later. <laughs> but also, many of you know Adam from his long career at the, uh, as president of the uh, Pre Progress and Freedom Foundation, as the director of telecommunication studies at uh, Cato Foundation, at Cato Institute, and also as a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation. So we've got a great panel, a great number of topics. Susan, why don't we start with you? Talk about, um, since you've blogged, what, three or four times already today <laughs> about the, this issue that happened yesterday. Why don't you give us your update on that and anything else you'd like to talk to on big issues? Oh, thanks, Gary. And thanks to Bill for sweeping over me. You know, I'm reminded of 1992 when I went to a conference on something called multimedia. And it sounded very complicated. And everybody sort of waving their arms and saying, oh my god, lots of things happening. Uh, this story is much like that. Things are actually much simpler than that. These are just bits traveling over a pipe. And we have this very interesting situation right now where a big pipe, uh, as Colin pointed out in the first panel, provided by a single actor in most major cities in the United States, will be shipping all of those bits. And uh, it, I think it's a mistake for people to somehow say, well, there's video over here and pay TV here, and it's all sort of different. It's just one virtual pipe with all IP transmissions over it. And let's say there are 700 virtual cable channels, maybe two or three of those have been allocated to internet access. So this uh, notion that there's something sort of special and gated off about internet access, I think we have to just blow off the table. We've got a single pipe, lots of bits, who gets to make the rules about which bits go where and what rules apply to them. It's really uh, incredibly simple. The, the wireless story from this morning is very interesting, but appears to be complementary with an E, that um, wireless access is not going to be substitutable for these gigantic pipes that are providing uh, speeds of 100 megabits or more. 75 to 85 percent of Americans will have only one choice of that kind of transmission. Verizon is backing off because its short-term investors aren't interested in providing this natural monopoly service, which is what it really is. And uh, the major cable operators have politely divided the country up among themselves. 
in the summer of love in 1997, uh, they all said, let's swap systems. You get Boston, I'll get Sacramento. So there are no choices of competitors. So in that context, where you have a single pipe, internet access is squeezed and completely within the control of the cable operator, what policy questions are raised? And it seems to me uh, they're pretty substantial. And it's just like all the fights we've had in the past. You guys remember pole attachments? <laughs> there was a time in 1978 and 79 when um, we had a big fight over a telephone company's control of the poles on which the new cable guys wanted to string their wires. And the phone company said, oh, very complicated, extremely complicated, can't be done, you know, don't make us share these facilities. And they were forced to by Congress, who actually gave the cable guys a subsidy you know, a protection so that the cable industry could arise. Exactly the same thing happened when the satellite industry was dying and needed, not dying, to trying to live and needed programming from the cable channels. Congress steps in with the 92 Act and says, yes, program access rules. Okay, so now we have this gigantic pipe and a gigantic merger between the most gigantic pipe provider and one of the four gigantic media conglomerates and uh, the questions raised are, you know, what do we do? And I think all the th stuff that Gary has already pointed out is going to be chewed over in the next few Congresses. What happens to all the public trustee obligations that we used to associate with broadcast? What happens with emergency services or protecting kids or indecency regulations when there's essentially a single actor? And most importantly of all, what happens to force those single actors in each community to open up their facilities, which are natural monopolies, not anything bad about that, it's just expensive to install them, and they should be shared with competitors. Because in all of these disputes, pole attachments, satellites, you know, everything we've gone through, uh, forcing these telecommunications companies to actually compete with each other brings the best results for consumers. When we're down to the single pipe, the competition's going to happen above it, and all of the video distribution rules and all these are all proxies for, um, you know, where should we try to intervene with policy wedges that will make sure that consumers are well served. So I want to simplify the debate and make it not quite as elaborate and multimedia-esque. Simplify. That sounds great. Marvin, can you uh, bring up some ideas that are the big issues you're looking at? Uh, well, I, I agree with just about everything Susan said. Uh, and I do think that we can think of this as sort of back to the future in terms of the big problems are still, uh, you know, uh, market power and distribution, sort of the net neutrality, open access, one big cable company problem, and also the problem of uh, access to programming by rival distributors. You know, we've seen this throughout history as well. And that is, you know, imagine that, you know, Netflix needs content in order to compete with a cable subscription. And so those are the two kinds of problems you've seen. We've seen them before. But if you, if you were actually to, to talk about you know, the actual you know, buzzwords that you'd see on Capitol Hill, I think that the transition to online TV raises really a host of issues across you know, telecom, content, you name it. And online TV isn't just entertainment and news. It's, you know, it's sort of everything. It's my student sending me a little video clip of his son dancing. It's my, you know, my dad, who's a businessman, showing me his droid of his store at the moment, live video. Um, and it's you know, the, the Boy Scouts that have uh, training through streaming video, you know, three million Boy Scouts. It's, very, it's mainstream, and it can be anything. It's social media. It's not just traditional TV, and we're not sure exactly where it's going, which is why it's so important that we think of it beyond just entertainment. And so I mean, the, the kinds of things you can expect to look at in terms of um, issues you've seen before, net neutrality, right, access to the, to the pipe, uh, bandwidth caps get debated, metered uh, pricing. These are all things that will be sort of telecom -ish issues that are raised. Uh, capacity, how do you have capacity for you know, Netflix uh, being 20% of peak capacity? Do we take the, do we uh, do incentive auctions for broadcaster spectrum, for government spectrum? Uh, uh, Dale Hatfield, who's, a, who's an FCC engineer of long, long time, has an argument that we should focus on fiber deeper and deeper into the network, even if it's not all the way to the home, as a way to alleviate capacity even beyond spectrum. So it's of capacity questions. There's the interconnection connect, uh, issue of Netflix 
uh, as a customer of Level 3 in the Level 3 Comcast dispute, where Level 3 is accusing Comcast of abusing a termination access monopoly to charge Level 3 to deliver uh, Netflix content. And so we have interconnection, you have broadband for all, you have devices, you have, um, you have the all vid proceeding, which has to do with opening up devices, you have the, the transition to um, tablets, and you know, Susan describes a story of one cable company that can provide uh, 100 megabits per second or so in every community, and DSL being unable to keep up. The story in the National Broadband Plan, whether or not it's accurate, is that we'll have some competition from the mobile carriers that'll be able to offer five to 10 megabits. And so we're moving to a world where you know, the competition might be between a natural monopoly cable company and the, the mobile providers, and then the sort of technological neutrality questions become important. So is five to 10 megabits sufficient for video delivery in a reasonable way? <laughs> it depends on compression technologies, but, it, but for some things, yes. So, so at any rate, there's just a whole host of questions, and, and the, the real question becomes, will the market, which we know has market failures we've seen before in terms of uh, concentrated distribution and, um, and uh, content control by old distributors, will the market uh, require government intervention at what level, by Congress, by the FTC, by the FCC, and will government inter uh, action actually screw things up more? How do you actually craft regulation in a changing environment? So they're hard questions and they're far ranging and it's, I think it's a really huge issue. What I wanted to highlight really was how many different things you have to think about, how many different issues might actually affect the future of online TV that you might not realize, such as you know, fiber capacity, spectrum, uh, and a lot of these content issues. I mean, the, the, to give one example, just very briefly, uh, before uh, uh, the others can speak. Uh, in the Comcast merger conditions, there are two different conditions for content, at least when it comes to online TV, one for linear TV and one for you know, programs when you sell them one by one. And so when you're talking about the different kinds of ways people will be, will be watching TV online, you have to think differently from a regulatory perspective based on the market, the technology, and the, the market failure challenges. Great. Richard Bennett from ITIF, what uh, is your perspective on all this? Big issues and what, what are you paying attention to? Um, let me, let me uh, kind of uh, begin by saying I, I was an engineer for 30 years developing things like video servers, set-top boxes, IP routers. So when I hear people say, well, it's all just bits, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, we're in the all IP world uh, already. Well, we're really not, okay? Uh, we've been making a very slow transition for the last 15 years from a, a world of broadcast over the air television to uh, what uh, a lot of us, you know, have wanted to have, have, have been trying to create for the last 15 years is a, is a world where television and other forms of entertainment are delivered by uh, over IP that we, we will have an all IP communications universe, but clearly we're not there yet. And if you understand even the sort of the first thing about how cable networks are engineered, they're not engineered to provide all IP. I mean, they use a, a system called MPEG transport, which is about 100,000 times more efficient in terms of its use of bandwidth for delivering television programming than IP unicast is. And so one of the issues that you have to face when you look at what, what we have to do in order to accelerate the transition to uh, internet-based television, which is apparently what the FCC and the DOJ uh, are trying to do with the merger conditions um, that they announced yesterday, one of the things that we have to do is figure out how to uh, pay for the replacement of an awful lot of equipment that was is deeply embedded in a network that was specifically designed for broadcast television delivery in which you send one copy of a program and everyone that wants to watch that program looks at that one copy. They don't get their own unique individual copy the way they do with IP unicast. So, the question is, you know, how fast do we make this transition? Who pays to replace the equipment that has been installed uh, over the last 20 years uh, to, to make the MPEG delivery of television programming possible over this system? Uh, there's additional requirements that have to, that, that uh, come into play in this picture in terms of improving the way the internet 
uh, interconnect uh, networks together. Right now, most of the interconnection that takes place on the internet is in uh, dedicated facilities, and mostly in what they call the NFL cities. So there's 15 or 20 major buildings in the United States in which most of the uh, interconnection between networks takes place. Those buildings are not conveniently located to the households that have to get television if it's delivered over the internet. And the bottleneck is not the internet backbone because with content delivery networks, the content is cached in, in one of these facilities uh, where the interconnection takes place. It's in moving it from that facility in that NFL city to your home. And, it had, and the first thing it has to do is cross over a regional area network within you know, the ISP. Uh, before it even gets to the last mile. And this, you know, this nebulous, this regional area network thing that is, that is based on what we, we now almost consider a legacy technology doesn't get any sort of discussion really in, in policy community because I think policy people tend to view these issues from a much like a 50,000 foot level uh, that doesn't deal with the specifics of how, that, how that, the financing and the deployment and the replacement of this equipment, the cycles on which those kinds of things happen. Um, and so it, there is a, a concern that I have over the, the merger conditions that were announced yesterday in that, that clearly the, the, in the goal of the FCC and the DOJ is to accelerate the transition to internet-based television, but they're really messing with the economics of how the uh, broadband networks are financed. I mean, they, it, it is true that the broadband networks are dependent on television subscription revenues in, in the case of, uh, well, television subscription and also telephony revenues in order to finance upgrades to those systems. And so by creating this new category, this uh, online video distributor, that has uh, special rights and, and no clearly defined responsibilities, uh, there, is, uh, there is threat to the uh, investment model. And also, I don't buy the idea that, we're, that there's a cable monopoly uh, for last mile. There's not a, they're pretty much the market share between cable and DSL has been 55, 45 for the last 10 years. And while right now, you know, cable has a greater capacity for shared bandwidth, DSL is the technology is not standing still. Fiber to the node is is a credible technology. There's 100 megabits uh, deliverable over twisted pair copper of a certain length uh, within the near future. So I don't see that the uh, that the duopoly is going to turn into an, um, a monopoly anytime soon. Richard, you a, Richard, you asked the point of uh, who pays and how how fast. Mm -hmm. Do you have an answer to that? Uh, Customer pays, obviously. I think the 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 answer before yesterday was that the uh, the payment is is actually going to come from the well the, an, the payment's going to come from the consumers, right? I mean that's the only place it can come from. That's where the, that's where the profit is generated is by selling subscriptions. But how soon? Uh, and if the if not, if this thing yesterday hadn't happened, I'd say we were on a we were on a path where the transition to uh, internet-based television as the dominant delivery platform was about five to ten years. And how did yesterday's action change that? <laughs> well, it had. I think the the results are going to be mixed because well, there's clearly a desire on the part of the policymakers to uh, accelerate the transition. I think they weakened the financial basis that funds the investments that will actually make the transition, you know, possible. We'll come back to that a little bit later, but Adam, why don't you uh, give us your brief on what's the big issue ahead and how it's going to be handled. Sure, Gary. First, I want to uh, just say congrats to my friend Tim Lord and his team for another wonderful conference. I don't think anybody said it yet, but year in and year out, they do this premier event of its type. It's really uh, one of a kind. Of course, I only engage in that sort of psychophanic brown nosing, so they'll invite me back to throw some bombs <laughs> like I'm about to. So uh, anyway, uh, on to business. Uh, you know, we, we need to step back and put this debate into some historical context here. Let's think about this. I mean, for those of us who were born before man set foot on the moon, you know, we remember a very different world for video. 
My favorite picture of childhood is a picture of my dad and my uncle sitting around on a couch just about to open some beers to watch some professional wrestling. Mm -hmm. And it's got me in the corner holding a rabbit ear antenna, remember rabbit ears? Mm -hmm. Over a 25 inch black and white television, remember black and white? Uh, and I'm holding one edge of the antenna and my arms out here like this, trying to get a signal on UHF 66 from Chicago. And I was the one who had to crank the dial all the way to get it to 66, and if it didn't come in, I'd crank it all the way back. So down. you were the remote control. I was the remote control for, for dad and the lazy uncles. So, you know, amazingly, it would come in some Sundays. This was a great thing. We'd rush home from church just to make sure we saw professional wrestling and you know, saw what Baron, Baron Von Raschke and the Crusher were wrestling. This was a big deal because we lived in an age of scarcity and we were dying for information and entertainment. I mean, for God's sakes, we had three, four channels if we were lucky, maybe five in rural Illinois and Indiana where I grew up, five. Now we have 565. That is unbelievable. And it's unbelievable because it happened at a time when we finally got serious about getting rid of the regulatory muckety-muck that prevented that sort of competition and innovation and diversity from happening. You know, to believe the narrative that I hear sometimes here in this town, we need to go back to the good old days of regulation with all these different requirements. Screw the good old days. I don't want those back. I want to clear the deck of that nonsense. Because 565 sounds a lot better than five to me. But you know what? It's not just 565 MVPD you know, channels that are available on cable and satellite and telco and so on. It's all those other choices. My kids don't know what it means to watch TV today. They watch YouTube. They watch Hulu. They watch Microsoft Xbox Live stuff, PlayStation. You know, I don't have a Roku, but you've got that option too. Netflix, all of these other things. I mean, these have all developed as we slow, slowly but surely started peeling back some of these regs or kept the hands-off approach for online video. But now we're about to change all that. We're told that we have to layer on all of those rules, those rules that gave us the glorious old scarcity days of you know, three channels. And we have to layer those on online video. But why? Why would we ever want to do that? I can't imagine a better time for us to reassess where we stand and to adopt a different regulatory policy. To the extent there are these regulatory asymmetries between the old and the new, Let's level the playing field in favor of freedom, in favor of getting rid of all that muck, mucky muck. And I think the way we do that is basically to say, draw a firewall, put together a firewall. We say, no, we're not going to apply retransmission consent. We're not going to have compulsory licensing. We're not going to have must carry. We're not going to have all these carriage regulations or localism mandates or anything else that did not bring us the diversity, the choice, the competition, and the innovation that they promised. Susan. Well, I. I really admire Adam, and I'm from the same generation, and I, I remember watching I Love Lucy and all that stuff, but this, the, what we tell ourselves in America about competition, you know, that we've had this raging competition over the last 25 years is absolutely not true. We've gone through a wave of consolidation, particularly in the media industry, but let's talk about the dog food industry. Uh, back in 2007, there was a big recall of dog food, and it turned out that all of these brands that we thought were independent were all relying on one supplier. Same thing for beer. You've got all these brands. It looks like it's coming from a million different places, but there are only two beer companies. Same thing for toothpaste. <laughs> We've got, it's true. And it turns out that for those 500 cable channels, um, it, I, there's been some analysis done of what those things are. If you exclude uh, non-English speaking peg channels, uh, broadcast, sports news, and let's look at the national channels, you cannot get carriage on the traditional uh, multi-system operators, the cable guys, if you're an independent. You just can't do it because they have so much gatekeeper control. So uh, they're serving us up a lot of stuff but it's all coming from very, very few sources. And I think that's important. So I agree with Adam that it's time to reassess, but my predicate for the reassessment is a little different. I, I, I just beg to differ because, I mean, let's look at facts, and I'd love to talk about beer all day long because, believe me, I love beer more than I love technology. But, <laughs> but the reality is... We'll, we'll drink to that. Yeah, absolutely, and we can drink lots of beers to that because there's more choice than ever in the beer marketplace today. 80% of all beers in the U.S. Come American from lagers, and yeah, so Coors. what? You've you got you to broaden your relative, relevant market, Susan. I mean, there's a lot more beers than that in this world now. So the, the point is, is that we can look at facts about this question of market consolidation or vertical integration. I mean, 1990, vertical integration percentage in the, in the MPBD marketplace, 50%. 50% of all channels available 
on a cable or satellite system, and at that point it was just cable, were owned by a cable distributor. Today that percentage is 15. Now it's going to rise a little bit because of Comcast NBC, but not much. 15%. And what about no, this? Number of channels or amount of viewership? Per, per, no, this is a percentage of channels that are available to MVPD distributors that are owned by those distributors. Okay. This is FCC data. But really quick, final point on this. Okay. The point is, this notion that somehow, oh, well, there's all this consolidation and there's all this, you know, uh, there's no chance for the independence. What in the, what genre isn't covered? How many chef channels do we have? And how many tennis and golf and everything else? <laughs> Every conceivable human interest. The one example I get from Susan and Harold when we're fighting on Twitter late at nights, and it's a fun fight, it's a fair fight. <laughs> uh, it takes two against one. Uh, anyway, the point is, is that we have to, <laughs> We have to take into account the fact that they're arguing about wealth TV being the best example. I mean, Donald Trump and you know Ivan Bosky's favorite channel. Which is distributed on, on two carriers, right? Two yeah, I, I get it on Verizon Fios. Let me tell you, that channel sucks. But you know, <laughs> who cares? It, it's not available. I, are you watching that while you're people. doing this blogging back and forth with Susan <laughs> and others? I had better things to watch. Just one little fact to add here that, yes, there are other channels not owned by MSOs, but they're owned by the sister oligopolists, the giant media conglomerates. Disney and Fox. And so oh, wait, Disney, wait, Fox, wait, and everybody wait, else. What, what are so, we arguing about here? I, 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 don't think anybody, I don't think anybody believes that the current MVBT, MVPD model is going to last very long. Is, is something that we want to preserve. I mean, don't we all sort of want this, uh, at least our MVPD model, to be enriched by in the availability of internet delivered content? And then we'll have, you know, we won't have 500 channels, we'll have 500 million channels, you know? They, everybody can have their, can watch their own channel if they want to. I mean, that's... We can do that today. And, and, and we can, and, and on a small scale, people do that today, and, you know, that will, I think, eventually become the norm, and so we won't, we won't have to have these discussions. And so Adam is right that these, you know, must-carry mandates and, and uh, equal time mandates, you know, that, that, that just is completely meaningless in a world in which most uh, television content is delivered over the Internet. Can I, can I but, dig but in? There's a question well, about competition. I was, I was well, let, let Marvin get in for a second. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say something I thought I'd never say. I, I agree with Richard Bennett on something. <laughs> I'll keep going. Okay. Now, uh, and on the, on the question of competition, there's sort of... There's I'm going to continue. With you. There, <laughs> there's a mantra about, you know, if we can have uh, unbundled access to the uh, cable plant or the used to be the copper loop. I guess you guys don't want the copper loop anymore now. You want unbundled access to, to the coax that the uh, cable companies have? Is that it? Because that will create all this competition. Well, how many people think the, the market for uh, cellular services in the U.S. is competitive? Can I see a show of hands? Okay. It, it's kind of lukewarm, right? Like most of the people that, that propose, you know, unbundling mandates for, for uh, DSL and cable think that, that it's not a competitive market. But if you look at the market for ISPs in the United Kingdom that has uh, an unbundling mandate, the distribution of the market for ISPs in the United Kingdom is about the same as the distribution of the market for cellular services in the United States. So if you think our cellular you know, carriers that that marketplace is not competitive, you're not going to get a competitive marketplace from unbundling, so you can just forget that. So you're saying a la carte is just never going to work? Now, I'm not talking about uh, programmatic unbundling. I'm talking about the, uh, the access to the, access the independent unbundling. ISPs. But are they... Are they independent? Are they unrelated? We'll come back to that because Bill, you had some uh, follow-up. Yeah, I, and I, I find myself, uh, you know, first off, you know, it, it, I think what Susan's point is, it's a, it's a legitimate point. It's the first panel, you know, it's talking about basically that saying, you know, it, it's all about conduit regulation. We don't even need to talk about content. It's just a bit pipe. And I think that, you know, if you are serious about thinking about, you know, um, regulating the conduit. Uh, you do need to really think about what that means. And I think, for example, um, the, the NBC merger does pose problems for that. Because if you are going to go down the road of regulating the conduit, then you really want to make sure that you've got clear boundaries between that which you're regulating and everything else so that the regulations don't pollute other things. You can't do uh, content-neutral regulation of the conduit. You know, you will be influencing that. And if you do think about some sort of conduit regulation, that's a model we, we put forth in the Telecom Act of 96 and then abandoned because we weren't able to get unbundled uh, elements to work. Unbundling the coax, as Richard's sort of mentioned here, 
um, presents a whole bunch of other technical questions and no one's really come up with a good model of how you'd actually would do that physically and whether or not the investment would be, uh, would, be would support that. Um, you know, there's the possibility of something like uh, unbundling at the wholesale level at, let's say, layer three, you know, some sort of bitstream type of access. And they're considering how to do that quite seriously in Europe and other parts of the world. And maybe we should consider that. We surely, it's certainly a debate and a discussion that's worth having uh, um, in academic communities. Politically, I don't think there's a whole lot of stomach in the U.S. to talk about real uh, you know, facilities-based, strong facilities-based unbundling a regulatory regime of the sort that Susan's talking about. Um, I, just don't, I just don't see it getting a lot of, you know, regardless of what you think of the arguments, I don't see it getting a lot of traction. And I think that's part of the reason why um, we're trying to go with, the FCC is trying to go with a more light-handed uh, sort of market-based approach. And we're trying to craft how that's going to work. Um, I, I agree, uh, I think, with Adam that uh, insofar as we think there is a problem, it isn't a video problem, it's a broadband problem. Let's talk about it as a broadband problem and not, and, and, and strip out all that program access, you know, uh, content type of regulation, keep that away from the internet stuff because when it gets into the internet space, it, it, it comes with it as if the internet space is gonna look like the traditional TV model. And I think that's a really big mistake. When they looked at this in Canada, which has much, much stricter broadcast regulation, and so the threat to the internet of broadcast content regulation getting into the internet space was much greater than I think it is in the US, I think um, uh, they understood, some of the, the more forward-thinking regulators understood that they need to dodge that bullet. And I would certainly hope that we would do the same thing uh, here. All right, so, thanks. So, uh, I'm going to go back to my agreement with Richard Bennett on a big principle, which is that we all want to see online video being... <laughs> Catch a picture of this. Y yesterday he called me his favorite communist, and I thought, <laughs> favorite, that is wonderful. And so this, this is... Uh, we Sorry, gotta... Harold. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm definitely not one, so it's fine. So um, I think online video uh, in, in the entertainment news space is the... Really, one of our big opportunities to counteract a lot of the media consolidation we've seen over the years and a way to give consumers choice when it comes to news, video, um, entertainment, you name it. I think its core uh, promise is addressing that sort of media consolidation, media control issue. Um, or, just, or it could simply be another distribution medium for the existing um, you know, powerful companies. Uh, the other reason why I think it's important uh, which hasn't been mentioned, but was kind of mentioned, is that it's considered a driver of broadband adoption. P people who will watch online yeah. video will get broadband. It'll be a driver of online, uh, online adoption, something the FCC uh, thought deeply about in the National Broadband Plan. So those are sort of big reasons why I, we think it's important. Um, but you know, in terms of the specifics of regulation and the problems of regulation that have, that have been mentioned, I mean, regulation will be imperfect. Right? Regulation is never perfect. But we're also talking about a world where the market's not perfect, where there's, you know, uh, the markets aren't contestable. It's really hard to get into the wireless industry without buying lots of spectrum for billions of dollars. It's hard to get into the wireline industry without, it's nearly impossible to be an overbuilder uh, against one of these cable companies or phone companies, both of whom were able to build their networks under monopoly regulation and guaranteed rate of returns, not under a competitive environment. So you have an imperfect market, you have an imperfect, you know, Unfortunately, Congress isn't perfect, and so the question is, you know, in our imperfect world, what are the best, what's the best outcome we can have? And when you say just in a blanket way, we can't have uh, any regulations that have applied to TV apply to the Internet, that sounds great, and, and in my heart, I, li I like that idea. But then I think of IVTV, which is a company that over the Internet offers linear channels um, of NBC, ABC, CBS, all of those channels, and is trying to take advantage of a compulsory licensing regime the compulsory licensing regime that would let them pay a certain amount of money and then, and then carry these channels. And this regime might be a good idea for the internet to ensure that there are lots of different online video providers. And when uh, Adam said, oh, you know, we've gone from you know, uh, uh, rabbit ears to 565 channels, we don't need regulation, in getting from there to here, we've had tons of regulations, such as compulsory licensing that I just mentioned, such as program access rules that open up the market for satellite and that put a lot of pressure on the cable companies. So some regulations work, some don't. And the question is, 
you know, which regulations can get us to the point where people are watching online video as they wish, and, I, um, and, uh, and you sort of contract media consolidation uh, problem that we've seen over the last several years. You know, since you mentioned IVI TV, and for those of you who don't know, it's IVI.TV, which is basically carrying mm -hmm. broadcast signals. Uh, there's several <laughs> other companies, FilmOn and other, mm -hmm. .com and others. Are these companies subject to the kind of regulation that, they, that uh, cable companies face? So, to, to, I think that's an open question because it's being litigated. I think everyone has sued IVI. But the IVI's argument is that they're simply transmitting the entire signal, uh, which includes the, the, um, the commercials and everything else. So to the extent that Comcast is regulated in its carriage, uh, in its licensing carriage of NBC, it's the same, same regime. S Susan, is that a monopoly breaker there? Or is that the kind of company that we should pay attention to? Yeah, I mean, the the role of the Department of Justice here is crucial in the Comcast NBC merger because they're they're going to be looking to see whether Comcast is able to leverage its control over crucial programming to block competition from online providers who might otherwise disrupt what Comcast wants to do, which is to keep money coming in from its cable subscriptions. It it knows, Richard, that it can't s stop IP TV, but it can just delay it for a while. That's enough for for Comcast. So um, I, I'm hoping that we'll get in this discussion to uh, really holding the antitrust division to very high standards because we do have, this is not just about the FCC. This is about an uh, industry that has divided up the country among itself. Um, and I am equally uncomfortable with things like imposed uh, must carry rules. I, I share the constitutional worries about those. Um, but uh, the, the market power issues in this merger are so enormous that it's a good thing the Department of Justice is doing its best. Bill, you got something to add to that? Yeah, I, I just, uh, um, I, I hope the merger works for Comcast. I'm actually really not so worried about it because I think that to me it's more of a signal of Comcast recognizing that uh, to take advantage of, of all the new media and to really make sense of this and these different sorts of opportunities, it needs to get uh, some, some content experience. And whether or not this will actually work out or not is, is you know, is, is something we'll, we'll see. We'll be able to see eight years, uh, you know, in the future. A number of these big media mergers haven't worked. And I, I don't think there's anything so wonderful about the NBC content they're picking up that's, that, that if, for example, they were to say, ooh, we're going to use this to shut down other uh, people. I think if were they to do that, they would quickly uh, hear from Wall Street that that was a stupid yeah. strategy. Adam first, and then... Uh... Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what uh, Bill said there, but... Uh, the love fest up here. Just, uh, well, let me shake it up a bit. Um, <laughs> I, I really think that these conditions in the Comcast NBC deal are really quite unprecedented. This is an unprecedented sort of regulatory shakedown of a company that obviously would do just about anything to get approval. And I think, unfortunately, these conditions probably are going to uh, be tantamount to death by a thousand cuts for, for the prospects for this deal. I think it preemptively saps much of the value uh, from the deal by essentially sabotaging the ability of the new entity to in any way, shape, or form uh, exploit its intellectual property and its content for uh, potential gain for its shareholders or for its consumers. I mean, that's concerning enough because, of course, as Bill mentioned, these sorts of deals don't have a very good track record. I mean, everybody knows the AOL Time Warner disaster of $100 billion of lost shareholder value in a matter of just a couple of years and the deal that unraveled within seven. But how about DirecTV and News Corp? That didn't fare much better. And, you know, I mean, Rupert Murdoch cast that thing off calling DirecTV a turd bird. You know, that was after three years after he did everything in his power to try to get that thing. So these deals just don't usually pan out. These conditions, I think, pre-script the narrative to come and foreshadow its eventual demise. Because if you can't exploit your intellectual property, and, and invest in it with the hope of getting an adequate return on it in some way, shape, or form, then what the hell's the use? We've essentially commoditized that content. Final point really quickly, the, the Hulu conditions are really interesting, and all these online video conditions really foreshadow the rise of a compulsory license for online video. I mean, that's essentially what we've done with Comcast here. You're going to license it. You've got a duty to deal. You're going to have to share that with everybody who wants it online and play by certain rules and divest yourself of any control in the, of your Hulu share. I mean, where are we heading here? We're heading, it's right back to the future about in terms of going back to a very heavy-handed approach to micromanaging all of these things that should be contractual interactions between big boys who can hammer out deals at a table. 
Adam, if nothing else, I'm going to remember this day as the one you're worrying about the future of MSNBC, one of your favorite networks, I'm quite sure. <laughs> Adam. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry uh, Marvin. Oh, me, sure. Yeah. I, uh, uh, yeah. I was next. Oh, Red Richard, you go next. Then. Don't jump the queue, no paper. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, um, I, I, agree with, I agree with Adam that, that Based on the AOL Time Warner experience, when I first heard about this merger, I didn't I didn't see any great competitive threat or any consumer threat. It, it seemed like a, I guess maybe this is one of these things that companies are going to keep trying until somebody gets it right, or or there you know, there's so many corpses on the battlefield that that it becomes radioactive and nobody wants to do vertical integration and in, you know anymore. I think it's probably an open question as to whether the seven-year <coughs> sunset on the uh, on the conditions, you know, outlasts the combined company or not. I guess we'll be, you know, taking odds on that. Um, but the, you know, the larger <coughs> question, and, and I want to agree with with Marvin on this, in in the spirit of all this, uh, you know, friendliness and we're going to be playing uh, kumbaya in the right. background right. here. Uh, regulation, I, I'm, ITIF is not an organization that thinks that regulation is inherently bad. We're not a libertarian, um, you know, let's all duke it out in the streets kind of an organization. We understand that markets are not perfect, that, that uh, you, you do have concentrations of power, although in the technology area they tend to be short-lived. Uh, large companies have public interest obligations. And so some of the some of the interesting questions that are raised by that 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 this merger sort of doesn't create, but it sort of puts them in focus, I think, in a way that they haven't been put in focus uh, before, is what the public interest obligations are going to be for this new class of video distributor called the uh, the OVD, and. Clearly, it'd be a mistake just to sort of, I mean, the, the kind of knee-jerk response in the policy world is, is because policy is driven by norms, right? The, so the, the ultimate purpose of every body of law and regulation is to, is to enforce the norms on a particular industry or particular uh, individual norms of conduct that are well accepted and you know there aren't by definition there aren't well accepted norms of conduct for new technologies and, and emerging you know emerging uh, paradigms of uh, information delivery like uh, internet-based television is and so so I think the, the one thing that I really like about this is that you know and maybe it's worth speculating a little bit is is the uh, is the order the conditions on this merger, does it help in any way to provide sort of a nucleus of the update of the 96 Telecom Act that everybody sort of acknowledges that we need, but nobody really knows how to, how to begin? Does it, and, and maybe in combination with the open internet order, are the ideas and the basic frameworks that we need to have in order to, to have a sort of a 21st century uh, Communications regime in the United States are they are they present in any significant way in those in those two orders? Marvin, a quick response if you want to, and then I have one other question before I turn it to the audience. Okay, so I, I just want to talk about why a cable company like Comcast would want to lock up content and not make it available to online providers. Or you know, um, Bill said Comcast has no incentive to not make content available, but we've seen through the history of distributors that they often try to keep content from new distributors that could compete with them. The most recent example being cable companies trying to keep content away from satellite providers. Uh, there's an excellent article by a professor named Tim Wu tracing the whole history of this. Um, and so that's, that's one reason why. And I actually had written a, a paper uh, and a complaint kind of arguing that Comcast should be forced and all the con big content providers should be forced to have a compulsory licensing regime for online video for a certain duration to sort of kickstart online TV and to get around this problem of uh, old distributors holding back content. Uh, and so one thing that we do not see in the order, uh, in terms of the shortcomings of the order, is there's nothing like a compulsory license. Comcast must make its content available uh, in terms of its programming uh, no, no more rapidly than other peer content providers are making it available. So it doesn't have to lead. but that of course, can lead to sort of implicit collusion where none of the companies move forward. Uh, and there's a lot of articles um, that suggest that the cable companies talk to one another and are aware, are concerned about making too much content 
available online. Uh, and the other <coughs> problem with the order, at least one other problem with the order, is that it goes to what Susan was talking about when she talks about dividing up the market. <coughs> the cable companies are doing something called authentication, where in order to watch TV online, you have to be authenticated as a cable subscriber. That is to say, you can't cancel your cable subscription and keep watching really good quality TV online. Uh, that's essentially you know, a tying arrangement, tying the online TV to the distributor, and that ensures that you can't have you know, a national Comcast TV offering that would compete with Hulu or Ivy nationally. Simply, the Comcast online offering is in Comcast regions, the Time Warner uh, offering is in Time Warner regions, and it's authenticated. They've continued dividing up the market, even in the online space, even though they could compete with one another nationally. So the, the fact that there's nothing on authentication is also a problem, in my opinion, uh, in the order. I want to shift gears completely on a topic that's really big right now, and that is spectrum allocation, spectrum usage. Obviously, the commission is very hard, uh, strongly pushing re, uh, re, tri, uh, retrieval of the uh, broadcast spectrum. It's interesting that we talk about uh, mobile video, mobile television, since over-the-air television is by its chance, uh, by its nature, uh, available to everyone. But yet, spectrum is going to be part of this next round of the debates. I think we all agree. Uh, interesting issues on mobile digital television, where um, Qualcomm just threw in the towel recently on its Flow TV venture, made some money on it. They sold the spectrum for three times what uh, to AT and T of all people, uh, three times what they paid for it a few years ago. And yet now there's this mo move to reuse the spectrum for a lot of purposes, including television. Any thoughts on that? And again, we can start with Susan. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to move from the looming cable monopoly to the looming spectrum crisis. <laughs> we had so many You're just crises. a barrel of fun here. I, I know, it's really fun. Uh, so um, I, I was happy to see in the president's executive order on spectrum, everybody's hunting it through their closets for spectrum. That's all they're doing in the agencies. They're looking for spectrum. And they're looking for spectrum from broadcasters on the commercial side. But a really important element of all this is that we should be using spectrum more efficiently, and the economists and everybody else should love this, why aren't we actually sharing more spectrum, actually uh, making way for secondary uses that would provide ubiquitous connectivity in each one of our houses? Why isn't that happening with, with greater frequency, as you might say? Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, I'm hoping, and I think we'll see over the next uh, few years, real emphasis on uh, spectrum fees, spectrum caps, all these levers that we can pull in spectrum policy to reallocate, but also the encouragement of trusting relationships, both between agencies and private actors and between private actors and other private actors that make it possible for what is actually an unlimited resource to be used much more effectively. Bill or others, will the spectrum fight work its way into the, the next round of congressional review? Uh, I, I certainly hope so, and I can find a lot to agree with in what Susan just had to say. I think the really crucial point when you're talking about spectrum is not just where to find more of it, but how to use the existing spectrum more flexibly. And what happened with the Qualcomm you know, uh, media flow sale is a good example of how we need to find ways to have natural market reallocations of spectrum and to have flexible use of that spectrum so that it can be traded efficiently in a market to fill these niches and needs as they develop. But we've not allowed that. I mean, we, you know, spectrum's still very rigidly zoned, if you will, by specific uses, and starting with the broadcast spectrum, obviously, most, most obvious in that regard. I mean, we ought to unzone all that, all the spectrum. We ought to allow it to be used fungibly and to uh, fill these needs as they develop. And that could start with incentive-based auction mechanisms, I think, to, to make the broadcasters a deal they can't refuse. But they should be given a, a you know something for their spectrum, and uh, I hope it's not forcibly taken from them, or else we just have a long fight. We need to find a way to have incentives built into the process so that they disgorge that spectrum. Quickly. Richard, doesn't the technology today allow much more repurposing of spectrum for alternative uses? Well, there, there's an emerging technology that it's not fully baked yet that. Uh, the cognitive radio, software-defined radio, uh, uh, opportunistic spectrum use, uh, dynamic spectrum allocation, all these, these concepts basically relate to the same idea, which is that, uh, that spectrum allocation can actually be made on a real-time basis in some scenarios. Uh, 
and probably 10 to 15 years from now, I think that'll be the standard in, in the way that most wireless systems operate. It's already, there's, there's already an awful lot of dynamic spectrum uh, allocation algorithms that are built into Wi-Fi. Um, and the, the people that operate cellular networks have every incentive in the world to be on the leading edge of making uh, greater refinements in those technologies, and they are, in fact, working on it. And so the, the uh, spectrum, it, spectrum policy always seems to be about a generation behind where the technology is. And one, uh, I mean, one of, the, one of the big problems is that we have, like as Adam uh, alluded to, you know, we have sp spectrum allocations that were made back in the 19-teens and 20s uh, and 30s for technologies that are now obsolete. And uh, that spectrum regime has been replaced with an auction regime. And then at, at some point, the auction regime itself will be out of date and will be replaced with, with another system. But I think the, uh, the sort of ownership model of spectrum in combination with an experimental use model so that we, we do have, like the, with the white spaces, and we have experimental licenses from the FCC, so we have opportunities to actually prove these new technologies in real world conditions and deal with all the unforeseen uh, situations that come up when you deploy a technology on a wide scale basis for the first time will, I think, help to get us where we, where we need to be. It is, it is the case that, uh, that by uh, reducing power levels and limiting propagation that, you know, finite spectrum becomes uh, very close to infinite spectrum. Richard, uh, from what you're saying, this, are you def just to get a definition on this, is a generation now a legacy generation of 30 or 40 years or a congressional action generation of a few decades, or is it an internet type of generation of a few months or a few years? These, uh, these technologies, it's about probably, uh, uh, it's a shortening cycle. I mean, the, at the time that the, uh, that the FCC was created, a generation of radio technology was 50 years. And today, it's probably more like about five years. Great. Bill or Marvin, anything else to add on spectrum opportunities? Uh, I think a lot of people are looking at the broadcaster spectrum and some government spectrum. The, the question becomes, do we have incentive auctions, or do we also increase sharing? And if we have incentive auctions of the broadcaster spectrum, right, the broadcaster spectrum is a whole bunch of broadcast you know, licenses with white spaces in between. And the FCC has a white spaces order, which would give uh, you know, companies the ability to uh, unli use unlicensed devices in those white spaces. If we're going to move to incentive auctions and give broadcasters their due, we also have to make sure that we give uh, unlicensed its due and ensure that that kind of spectrum is preserved for uh, the innovations that we'll see out of you know, Microsoft, Google, all these companies that are looking at the white spaces. So. Um, I I'd absolutely agree with the, the notion that uh, uh, if you if you take that broadcast spectrum, we ought to be able to rezone that and make it you know so we ought to think about sort of regulating spectrum for optimal uh, radio design and not be thinking about uh, regulating spectrum because we need um, to have television service or we need to have this or we need to have that. It's like let the market figure out what those services are and let's get the spectrum regulated so we can have the right kind of technology markets technology. And I think so the incentive based auctions I think is absolutely the way we need to go for the broadcast spectrum because, you, you know, just politically, you don't want to be fighting the broadcasters for another 100 years. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I also agree absolutely with Marvin that uh, we need to have some public parks. Uh, it's not, you know, to give that all spectrum to the same old players. That would be a mistake were we to do that. And that spectrum has, has sort of special, special value. Um, I think that when we think about sort of the future of video and sort of the new media, uh, I hope um, a, that we're able to separate this question about sort of the conduit types of regulation, what's the access to these sort of physical conduit from these sorts of content regulation. And when we think about the content regulation, let's keep our hands off the internet as much as possible because all these old models of what media ought to look like, I don't think really apply in an interesting way in the internet. You know, what we're talking about in terms of television, what wireless is going to enable, it's not going to be more Red Sox games in more places as much as I might like that. Um, and we'll certainly get that too. It's going to be your kids' um, little league game. It's going to be what's going. What's the lunch thing? It's going to be the webcam, the surveillance stuff, and all the things that are going to come out of that. That's really going to be interesting. You know, the, the medical applications. Who knows the wellness kinds of applications, the ability to use your cell phone to project the video and making sure the infrastructure is out there to do that. All of that is going to be sharing this 
And I hope that's more of what is going on over this the, this spectrum, this bandwidth, and these networks than um, just people watching the same old. Bill, Bill you're, so, you're seeing my song at CES. I produced a program on monetizing content, and the, everyone's trying to figure out how to make money off selling your kids' baseball game. But you're going to watch. <laughs> Anyhow, there's a lot of questions. We'll start over here, and uh, Tim, maybe you can pick up the uh, mic for the next question. Identify yourself in your Thanks, uh, Rick Zimmerman with NCTA, and actually it's a perfect segue because you mentioned monetizing content. And so I don't think I heard anything other than talking about Comcast new content, and granted it's a perhaps unique uh, um, uh, merger of content and distribution, but what about Viacom and Disney and Fox and other content providers? Um, Marvin talked about authentication as a limitation I think, uh, from our perspective, authentication is all about what the programmers want. The programmers don't want to undermine their own economic model. They already have an arrangement with distributors. They want to ensure that folks that have legitimately uh, acquired that content through the distributor are able to see it. It's increasing the audience. It's not a limitation. It's not the distributor that's saying we have to authenticate. So al al along the same lines, you mentioned IVI. Uh, with a compulsory license, but I don't know of any way in which they're compensating broadcasters. I don't know of all, all the details. So the question is just, as these, uh, as content moves to these other platforms, how do the content owners, the content producers, this kind of content, unlike perhaps your kid's uh, Little League game, is not free to produce, how are they compensated? How do they have the incentive to continue we're, to produce We're going to start with our joy, joy and light today, Susan. <laughs> Well, it's a fascinating question, and the, the many of the programmers that you've listed share interests with the distributors to keep this channel constrained, to say we're going to deal with the cable companies under the TV everywhere umbrella, where many of them are playing, and that's pumping tens of millions, 120 billion, I mean, huge amount of money, and I have it in my notes, it's in my blog post, off to the, off to the programmers every year. They rely on this. But Viacom actually showed up in front of the commission and said, we're worried about the Comcast merger. Why did they do that? Because they're not part of the TV Everywhere umbrella. They're interested maybe in going out on their own online and getting their stuff out that way. And what's so fascinating is that there are likely contracts between Comcast and some of the programmers saying, don't sell your stuff for any less than we pay you. So think about that. Don't sell your stuff for anything less than we pay you. That means it's very difficult for the other programmers to safely go out online to another you know, distribution channel that might pay them a little less. So DOJ is very interested in those contracts, looking for a way just to wedge open the marketplace, and it may be Viacom that does it. Susan, uh, Viacom's suit against YouTube is an indicator of how intent they are in selling their material themselves. And notice they've got a deal now with YouTube, so that worked out rather well. Yep. But, but I, I'm, what's wrong with that? I mean, for the, you know, contracts and these efforts to authenticate are efforts to secure and to monetize content and intellectual property. If you want to have an investment made in intellectual creativity, you've got to have some stability and security. I'm sorry, that's the way it works. This is why we have contracts and intellectual property. The, the fact of the matter is, all these chicken little tales we hear, though, about exclusion and consumers not being able to access, I'm sorry, I can't think of, I mean, there's so many places where my daughter can get all of her favorite shows. We, could, we sit down and say, oh, you want to watch it on Xbox, you want to watch it on YouTube, you want to watch it on Netflix, I guess we could watch traditional television, you want to do that? Oh, no, why would I do that, Dad? You know, so, the mind should... boggles at all the places where you can get content these days. It's not being closed up. You don't make money by stopping the flow of your content to all these other platforms. You make deals to get them on those other Adam, platforms. Adam, let, let's let an economist also add it to that, Bill. You know, there was, I mean, sort of the history of the economics of these was there was sort of, you know, the, the view that these sorts of tying arrangements and other sorts of things must be, uh, you know, there's no good reason for them, and so they should just be illegal. And then there's this all this economics research, you know, from the 70s on that basically says, well, actually, that's not true, and the rolling back of, you know, saying why, why tying is economically efficient when it makes sense. It's not that um, there aren't times when if you're uh, a monopolist and you have market power, you can't use these to potentially harm the market. But um, the, the fact that these exist, they exist in perfectly competitive markets. And I don't think anybody 
uh, looking at the content business, the content creation business, uh, thinks that that's a business that isn't intensely competitive. And when you think about like how you do pay for the intellectual property, in, in media stuff, it's the windowing. I mean, it used to be you had hardback books came out first and you charged a high price for those, and then the paperback books came out and you got a lower price, and then over time, you know, you sold down. And then there was with the movies, you did the movie release, and then you did the um, television, the window, the and then you did the VCRs. Right. And with the internet, all this sort of stuff has been jumbled together. It's just gotten a hell of a lot more complicated. Complicated. And the contracts that go back to the various um, uh, talent and those sorts of things have really sort of restructured the yep. industry. If anything, they've been the big gainers in this whole sort of programming. Complicated. Game. We've got time for maybe one or two questions. I would love to talk about advertising or DRM. Let's start. Let's start in front here. Okay. Quick. Quick question. And quick answers. Yeah. Uh, all right. Quick question. Uh, maybe it's just a matter of clarification. But I, I'm a bit confused about the authentication procedures. First off, what I read was that. Uh, the NBC Compact, Comcast deal is going to require Comcast to offer a standalone internet access service at $49.99 without having to obtain their cable TV service. Does that mean that, they, that the customers would not be able to access online video? And then secondly, doesn't this authentication procedure run afoul of the net neutrality uh, rules? Does anybody have a yes or no answer to that? Yeah, and then we'll go to the there, question in the back. There's a very quick answer, which is when Marvin's talking about authentication, he just means into the pay TV service as it's offered online. Oh, right? So Comcast offers its, its programming oh, online. Pay TV it's X, online. Xfinity. Something. Xfinity or, yeah, okay. or TV everywhere. Thank you. Question in the back. And then we'll give Harold the last word. So, uh, uh, identify yourself, please. Mark McCarthy with Georgetown University. Um, so, one of the conditions appears to be on the merger that uh, the merged entity uh, enter into arrangements and deals with local nonprofit news outlets. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a promising way to deal with the question of the production of news in light of the economic problems in the newspaper industry. Anybody know anything more about that and can comment on that? I can say something, or you want to? No, no, no. Okay, um, this was modeled on, as I understand it, that there's a very um, thriving program in San Diego where there's a nonprofit entity that has joined up uh, with a for-profit entity to make sure that it's making the money it needs for news, and it's trying to replicate that model across the country, and it's a very interesting um, solution. As the for-profit entity is one of the, is the big TV station in town, I believe, isn't it's it? The, yeah, it's, it's, sorry, it's a big TV station in town. It's NBC funding, owned, I think, is it, wasn't it? I think so, funding, yeah. funding the local San Diego news operation, and it's working, and a healthy model, and so this is a way of uh, shifting resources without regulating, in a sense, to make sure that uh, these nonprofit entities get, news may end up being a nonprofit business because the advertising model isn't going so well. And I promise the last short question, Actually, can I get the last question? Okay. Okay. Um, although I feel bad, I got invoked a couple of times. I wish I had a right to respond to a couple of those, but I'll take it to Twitter. Um, just real quick then, one of the issues that didn't get dealt with in Comcast NBC was the Comcast Level 3 dispute. Uh, leaving aside the specifics of that dispute, of who, whether it's Comcast that's right or Level 3 that's right, just quickly to the panelists, is this the foreshadowing of a new movement within the industry where for 10 years we've had a fairly stable CDNs on one side, backbone delivery on the other side. Does this foreshadow that we are now going to look to see the either the market or regulators or both um, uh, looking to shifting patterns of internet traffic and who pays whom for what? Because I, I do think whoever said it's got to come from consumers, the other place it could come from and has in the telephone world uh, has been on the back end with things like access charges and termination fees and so forth. Sort of a yes or no question. Yeah, the other, the other place that it's going to come from and the reason that Internet TV is inevitable is that, you know, when you have unicast TV, you can have personalized advertising. And so the, and that's that the reason that the content producers ultimately want this to happen, right? If every, every movie, every television uh, sitcom that gets delivered is personalized in terms of, of the, the advertising, and it could actually be, you know, even in the in the program content itself, there could be uh, there could be commercial uh, references, you know, built in that are that are sort of tailored to the individual viewer. Then there's uh, there's another source of revenue, you know, in terms of, of the advertising. 
And, and I'm glad you raised the, the Comcast Level 3 dispute because I think that those kinds of questions about peering and transit, which everybody, I mean, the FCC, the Justice Department, everybody's tried to, is, you know, maintained a hands-off attitude towards those kinds of disputes historically. Those disputes are heavily implicated when you have open internet rules and when you have rules about TV carriage and, and about trying to create a competitive marketplace for these uh, OVDs. And I think that, that kind of, those kinds of questions are going to get an awful lot of attention and, and the, the idea that, you know, that regulators just don't deal with those kinds of disputes, I think that's, that's going to be history you know, in fairly short order. So yeah, I, I agree. I think I think that regulators should look at disputes like the level three Comcast dispute and at least exercise oversight and try to figure out what's going on in the market. And the traditional hands-off approach to peering and transit was sort of, according to level three, deeper into the network where uh, two you know two backbones would come together and exchange traffic. And if they didn't exchange traffic, another carrier was available. Now we're talking about the last mile provider of Comcast. Uh, and it's a termination access monopoly, and I think it's a different question. Right. Thank you. I think, Tim, you had a... Uh... Yeah, I had um, one last question. And I'm, I'm sorry this has to be the last question. We have um, apparently um, some of our speakers have to go down to the launch of a new digital think tank downstairs um, in, the, in the ground floor. Uh, I believe it's Tech Freedom is launching today, so downstairs. So we have to cut this short. I'm sorry. But um, my last question would be, um, we've talked a lot about regulators. Um, but the reality is that Congress has issued a lot of rules and rules and legislation to protect kids, to protect privacy when it comes to video programming, whether it be uh, keeping children away from objectionable con content, whether it be protecting the privacy of what people watch on cable systems and video rentals. Um, my question is, how is Congress, as this is all inevitably going to, as you say, to online video, how, will Congress seek to extend the rules it's already made to protect kids and protect privacy, rules that they've already established, or are they just going to let it wash away? That's one question that, that was really one of our topics. Why don't we just go down the panel and everyone give Tim a quick answer. How's Congress going to act on this? Uh, um, this is a political thing. I, I hope uh, they basically let it wash away. I hope they don't try and get into this, because I think if they do, it's just going to be a mess. And I would see it to be political grandstanding of a, of a fairly unseemly uh, source. Marvin? So I, I have a different answer. I was at CES, and there are all these cool new gadgets. And people were telling me about gadgets. I don't know if they can actually do this, but they can, you know, they're gadgets that know you're moving, right? Like the, the Xbox Connect. And they can identify, I guess, if you're like an adult or a child. And some of these devices apparently can tell where you're looking on the screen based on your eyes. And that kind of stuff just strikes me as, at least a, when it comes to children, a privacy issue that I can imagine Congress would have to have some oversight over. And there'll be really interesting privacy questions. My main suggestion would be figure out what's going on in the market, talk to people actually in Silicon Valley, et cetera, and figure out what devices sort of help encourage the market in the right direction on privacy. Richard, will Congress take some action on any of these? I, I, I got a two-word answer to, to, these que to these questions, and it's parental controls. Okay. Adam? Well, the answer to Tim's question is yes. Uh, Congress will assert itself, and so will other independent regulatory agencies. And I think the, it's clear that the era of hands off the net is over. The era of hands all over the internet has begun. And it's only a question of time before how long we uh, get before we change the name of the FCC to the, the Federal Internet Commission. And Susan, Congress take any action on any of these issues? I'd like to offer Adam a beer. <laughs> and uh, we, we will have a long talk about this. A lot of choices out there. Uh -huh. Okay, so here's, here, here's what we're going to do. Instead of, instead of round of applause, we're going to sing Kumbaya to this audience right now. And thank you very much for a great panel. <laughs>